our main this is our main lab over here these blue objects these are part of the vibration isolation system so this is a vacuum chamber and inside each one of these types of chambers lives a mirror of LIGO this is very rare for us but it turns out that the this chamber is actually not under vacuum right now see the door is craned off and if you come over here you'll see that it's actually open for work going on inside we're trying to measure something that's 10 to the minus 18 meters of motion. And you know, when I first heard it, I actually thought this is absurd, this is crazy. And then I just couldn't let go. I was like, okay, this is crazy enough that we've got to try to do it. And I was hooked. I, I've been hooked ever since. I've been hooked since 1991 when I started this uh, as a graduate student in the field. My name is Nergis Mavavala and I'm a professor of physics at MIT. you had the surface of a pond uh, and you poke your uh, a, a rock or your finger in ripples starting from where you're poking the pond set out and they spread over the surface of the pond so Einstein's picture of space-time is also is similar where you have some massive object could be a black hole or a neutron star and the radiation the, the waves from that objects uh, leave the object and, and propagate through space they travel at the speed of light so that's what a gravitational wave is now it turns out that gravity is a completely unexplored messenger. It encodes information about the structure of space-time, about the warpage of space-time in ways that light cannot even sometimes contain. So a black hole is a very good example. If there's a black hole that sits around in, in space and has nothing bright around it or no other matter that's falling into it that can glow, we can't know about it. We can't learn much about it. Whereas if we could study the gravitational waves from that black hole, we could reconstruct almost everything about it. LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, is one of a handful of such very big experiments scattered across the planet to detect gravitational waves. So how do we then go about measuring these waves? So now imagine that my two space-time objects were in fact a laser and a mirror. One of the effects of a gravitational wave is that as it passes through some region of space, it shrinks and stretches the distances between objects in that region of space. So all I have to do is measure the travel time of the light going out to the mirror and coming back. If a gravitational wave passed through this region, then the distances between these two would change and the light travel time would change and I could register or record the passing gravitational wave. And the principle is as simple as that. Now in reality, it, life is not so simple because of, uh, of the weakness of gravitational waves. They are extremely faint, if you will. So if you take a space-time distance of about a meter, say so this distance spacing, and if a gravitational wave came by that came from a re reasonably you know, nearby neutron star binary system, it would change that space-time distance by 10 to the minus 21 meters. That's a million times smaller than a proton. So if you want to do this, there's really only two things you need to do, but you need to do them really, really well. The one thing is you need to make mirrors very still. And then there's a second thing, which is it's kind of useless to make a mirror that's so, so still if you have no way of knowing how still it is. So you also have to have a way of measuring the, those tiny motions, and that's where the laser light comes in. So we use the laser light as our meter stick for telling us where is this mirror relative to the laser. You can think of squeezing as making our meter stick more precise, making it a micrometer stick or a nanometer. In our case, it happens to be an atometer stick, but okay. Well, let's just see how we're doing here. All right. Georgia, Eric, and Maggie together are building a squeezer that can go inside the vacuum. Right through that door is the open chamber. Yeah. That's where this is going to go. On this table is where we have the, the lasers that we get our light for, which are coming over here to bring the light. And this is where the actual uh, cavity is where we're generating our squeezing. Think of a laser having all of its noise distributed in a ball or, you know, or a circle. 
If the noise is represented by the radius of the circle, it just says no matter which way I look along the circle, it's the same amount of noise. Now when you create a squeeze state, what you're intrinsically doing is you're taking that circle and you're squeezing it into an ellipse. And now what you see is that along the thin part of the ellipse, you have smaller, less noise than your original circle did. But along the long part of the ellipse, you have more noise than your original circle did. And that's what we're observing on the spectrum analyzer. When we look at the, 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 the shot noise level, that first line, that's just the round ball. It just basically says noise is equal anywhere you look. So when we use squeeze light, we actually are arranging the quantum fluctuations of the light so that they are smaller along the axis we're measuring and therefore we can make a more precise measurement. The squeeze light source that we're building, when we can make a factor of two improvement, we think that's really worth doing. The plan is for it to be delivered to the LIGO observatories sometime in the next year or two as part of upgrades to the advanced LIGO detector. There's a lot of excitement that we'll see those last seconds to minutes of the lifetime of binary neutron stars and black holes that's exciting and it's going to be new and never done before. But really, the most exciting thing probably is that we don't know what else is out there that we can see using this new technique. The gravitational waves that we're searching for, they happen to be in the human audio band. So they just happen to be that our instruments are most sensitive sort of from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz, which is very much the human audio band. So when we observe these gravitational waves, we'll be listening to the universe. So until now, we have sight, we can see, but we haven't heard. And now we're about to turn on another sense. So I started sketching and trying to think of how a membrane with some proteins in it would look across two pages um, and work with, with the text on the page. It's really important in the creative process, all that discovery that happens. 